So here we're going to discuss uh, Hume's concept of empiricism his, and his radical skepticism. And the idea here is to uh, look at the concepts of causality, or cause and effect, and induction. And the reason that this is interesting is because when we are done with Hume, most of us are kind of comforted by the language and we're, you know, it, it's accessible and we all understand what he's talking about because, oh, knowledge comes from experience. Yes, of course. But the end result is rather disappointing. And I think it's easy for us to overlook that because it's so comforting. So, first of all, um, empiricism is a nice theory. I mean, the first philosophers I ever read were actually Locke, Berkeley, and Hume, in that order. We don't read Berkeley because we don't have time in this class, but it, it's essentially a, a critique of Locke. Um, and it, it's surprisingly accessible. You say, I, I understand what they're saying. I, ex, you know, knowledge comes from experience. What other reason could there be? Those rationalists and their you know, cold mindset and all of that, blah, blah, blah. But there's an inherent flaw in thinking, specifically, all knowledge comes from experience. There's problems with that view, and this is highlighted in Hume. Now, I would like to remind you all that this chapter of the textbook, and it, it is mentioned there, I think, um, it's dividing empiricists and rationalists as if they're two separate camps. And this is something that's been done in the history of philosophy for, well, it's for reasons of ped pedagogy. It's easiest for us to teach you about the differences if we make it like there's two camps and they don't agree. That's not true at all. There's, you know, the empiricists have a bit of rationalism and the rationalists have a bit of empiricism. But the way we teach it is there's these two strict ways of looking at the world. Both of them have their problems and then Immanuel Kant comes along and combines them and it's beautiful. And while Kant is, of course, the best theory, as we will see next week, uh, it's not totally true. So don't think that rationalists and empiricists are, you know, totally polar opposites. But with Hume, we're looking at a version of empiricism, uh, empiricism that's sort of radical. All knowledge comes from experience. Well, okay, that sounds good. I experience things, and I understand that that's where my knowledge comes from, and there can't be anything like innate ideas. And what, what little knowledge reason adds to my day-to-day -day life is negligible. It's, it's insignificant. But you can't actually do anything with that. Here, here's why. So, the scientific method, of course, everybody's familiar with that, you know, we all learn that in grade school. But when a scientist wants to prove something, they want to prove a conclusion, they have to develop a hypothesis and test the hypothesis. Now, the equivalent in experience is uh, each of the experiments that the scientist does. So, he says, the, the, the scientist says, if I do X, then Y will happen. So, how do you test that? Well, you do X, and then you see what happens, that's an experiment. Um, you do that a hundred times, a thousand times, you get other people to do it, and the more often and the more frequently you do X and you get Y, the more probable your hypothesis is. You're never going to get 100%. You're going to get, you know, it's going to go up to 99% and you sort of do that. Um, that's inductive reasoning. Uh, it, it, it creates probability, and it's very important for the modern, you know, for modern science, empirical science. Um, but what we're missing here is what is basing, what's, what's founding induction itself. So I'm not so much concerned about experience being the problem. I'm concerned with finding a justification for the inductive method, which is okay, what I just said, what we use in you know, the modern scientific method. And this is where Hume's problem is. So he, he points out, well, the text points out two issues that are related. You have the issue of cause and effect, and you have the issue of induction. And both of them share the same common thread. If all of my knowledge comes from experience, all of my knowledge comes from experience, there are certain things that we cannot get in experience. The cause and effect one is, it's easy to see it, but it's really hard to understand it. So let's say, uh, in the textbook, I use the example of the billiard balls, I use the example, or example of firing a gun. Let's let's use the billiard ball one because it's common, okay? So billiard ball X and billiard ball Y. You can use the same variables just like in the scientific experiment. When I hit this ball with the, with the um, pool cue and it moves this direction and it hits this ball and it causes this ball to go the other direction. Beautiful. Cause and effect. We see a causal relationship. But do we really? What we experience or what we see is this ball getting hit with something and moving and then hitting this ball and moving there. Now we say that that ball caused the other ball to move, but how in experience do we actually see that? We don't. 
Um, I, I think of it in a different way. When you, if you want to think of your experiences as like moments in time, maybe that's helpful. So I'll take a high-speed camera and I'll film the billiard ball getting hit with the pu pull cue, and you know the, the, the high-speed camera can take a thousand frames a second or something like that. And I slow it down and I look at each of the images. That's sort of how Hume's thinking about how we experience things, little bits of time like that. Well, there's nothing in that video that I've made, a thousand frames a second, that shows the connection between the cause and the effect. There is merely events that, sh that I can say that's cause and that's effect. Well, what connects them? Nothing. There's just more events, they just keep going. So, based on my experience alone, I can't say that because I hit billiard ball X, billiard ball Y will go that way. And then you say, but no, I can say that. So why can't I say that? Well, I can say it because, you know, in the past, I've hit billiard ball X and it's hit billiard ball Y and it's done that. I can say that because I have past experiences. Okay, so there's nothing in your experience itself that tells you that that's connected. It's something that you've seen happen and you're assuming that it's going to happen again. That's all that's happening. There's no experience of the connection between cause and effect. It's, as Hume says, a habit of the mind. It's a psychological feature that we add based on past experiences to things that we do now. So, the, the other example, firing a gun. I'm, I'm out shooting clay pigeons or my neighbor's house or whatever. I'm, you know, out there, bang, bang, bang. I fire a hundred rounds and every time I fire and the gun doesn't jam, the bullet comes out of the gun. And so, because I've been doing this so much and I'm such a redneck and I'm just, you know, firing my gun up here at my neighbor's house, no longer shooting clay pigeons apparently, um, it's, it becomes something that I, ex I anticipate. It's happened in the past so many times. When I fire the gun again, the same thing's going to happen. It's highly unlikely that when I fire the gun, a bottle of water will fly out of it. I mean, that's ridiculous. However, it's not, incon it's not inconceivable. It's absolutely not going to happen. But it's not impossible. It's only improbable. Why do we say that the gun will fire? Well, because when I fired it in the past, it fired. And, you know, when I pulled the trigger, the bullet came out. So when I pull the trigger again in the future, it will cause the bullet to come out. What we're doing here is we're making an inductive argument. So that's how causality, X hitting Y and causing Y to move, that's how they're connected. It's based on past experiences. I'm making future judgments. Okay, so what's the problem? I mean, I don't see it. What's the problem? Well, first of all, we can't experience causation. We can experience the, the events that we call causes and the events that we call effects, but the connection between the two is something that we've added. It's a psychological thing we've added. The same thing is happening with induction. Why do I say that the sun will rise tomorrow? Oh, I'd say the sun will rise, but what I should say is the sun will probably rise tomorrow. Well, I mean, it, it, it's, that's just what it is. I mean, think about it. Why does the sun rise? Well, we know why the sun rises. It has to do with the rotation of the earth and all of this kind of stuff. But based on experience, what I'm saying is I've seen it rise in the past. My parents have seen it rise in the past. My parents' parents have seen it rise in the past. Neanderthals saw it rise in the past. Um, based on past experiences, I can say with some probability, some certainty almost, that it will rise again tomorrow. But it's not incoherent to say that it's, it, it won't. There's very slim possibility that some really strange thing will happen and it just won't. It's not, it's not inconsistent to say that. I mean, it's obviously absurd, but it's not inconsistent. But that, that information that I'm saying, that judgment about the future, I'm making based on my past experiences. And those experiences, again, are just adding that sort of psychological, uh, that habit of mind. There's nothing in the experience itself that grounds that. So what does Hume say about induction? What, ba what grounds that, the fact that because something, because I've experienced in the past, I can say it's likely that it will happen in the future. That, that act itself is induction. What grounds that? Well, let's think about it. Why would I say that the sun will rise tomorrow? Well, because it's happened in the past. And things that happen in the past tend to happen again in the future in a similar way. Well, how do we know that? Because in the past, when things have happened in the past, they tend to happen in the future in the same way. So, I'm using induction to ground induction. I'm saying, based on past experiences of things happening in the past and then happening in the future, I can say with some certainty that things that have happened in the past will happen in the future. That's purely circular. It's purely circular. There's no justification to that at all. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. Um, so, we, we use induction because it's, quote, comforting. 
or it's convenient. Um, uh, what was the discussion? It said it was convenient and keeps us sane. No better way you can say it. And Hume would absolutely agree. He said there's nothing there to, to ground the, the use of induction. It's just something that we do. Okay, great. Move on with your life. But if you want to have any certainty in knowledge, or any grounding at all, for that matter, you cannot, absolutely cannot base it on the assumption that you've made it from a circular argument. That's insane. Um, it shows the disconnect between an empiricist who thinks that all knowledge comes from experience and what that experience is supposed to be of. Experience is supposed to be of, you know, reality and the real world and things around you. But if your experience is really just based on assumptions, I mean, that's, that seems to me a little bit psychotic. You're kind of in your own mind there. Um, I just put this out there to show you how, while it's nice on the face, you know, radical empiricist, all knowledge comes from experience, great, I experience things, it's, it's real, it's down to earth. No, it's really not. It's, it's uh, based on a set of assumptions that have no grounding, and there's a huge danger there, too. If you're a scientist making your, your hypothesis and testing it, you're doing it because you just basically assume that that's how it's supposed to work. There's no justification to that method. Um, so going forward, we'll look for a way to find something to ground our experiences, which obviously can't be an experience itself. It has to be somewhere from somewhere else. Well, how would we get knowledge from something that's not experience? Well, we're going to have to introduce rationalism, at least a little bit of rationalism in there. Um, otherwise, our inductive claims and our claims about the relation of cause and effect, they're just conveniences. That's really all they are. Again, Hume calls them habits of mind, but they're basically conveniences, so.